Well, good afternoon. Thank you uh, very much for the opportunity for the invitation. Um, I mostly want to talk about this pursuit of unifying boundary layer and convection parameterizations. And in a way, part of this is talking about these two different communities coming together in a certain sense. So a lot of this research, well, I'll, I'll show a lot of our research, but some other research performed with several colleagues, of course, at JBL, Caltech, UCLA. And I'll start with, um, with a slide, with, with, with a, a figure that many of you have seen many times and many of you have you know, helped produce in one way or the other. But the key aspect here is really the fact that, you know, it highlights the significant uncertainties in climate prediction. And often it's sort of well accepted that these uncertainties are re related to clouds and, 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 and all that. And this entire group has worked on this. Um, full screen. Sorry? Full screen. Oh, it's not full screen. Oh, okay. View. View. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. So I, I found a nice quote from um, Harakawa about the fact that when you think about clouds, you have to think about all of these different processes, right? That the cloud is really a product of complicated interactions of moist convective turbulence with larger scale circulations with radiation and microphysics. That's not, you know, that's well accepted among this group of people and many others. It's not necessarily well recognized. And it's not necessarily well recognized that actually when you talk about clouds and the cloud problem in climate projections, you're often talking about a turbulence problem and a convection problem, right? Not only, of course, as you know. So when we try and when we've tried over the last five decades to represent these different physical processes in weather and climate models, we do it in a very modular way. Now, there are several very good reasons why they're very modular because, you know, historically these communities have sort of lived a little bit apart from each other and each has developed its own different module. It's also because the problem is really remarkably complex. So bringing it all together, it's, it's, it's a real challenge, as many of you know very well. So this is a nice figure that is originally inspired, I think, by the Arakawa figure that then several people created different incarnations. And I think the last one was Bjorn uh, helping, it, uh, helping produce and create it for the IPCC AR5. And you can see this transition from the, let's say, let's say this is a transition from California to, to the ITCZ. You see all of the different physical processes and manifestations of Navier-Stokes with phase transitions and with radiation. And then in red, I have some of what in many models are actually different routines, different pieces of code to actually represent what's going on. And what is nothing else than, you know, different manifestations of turbulence with phase transitions and radiation. So I can tell you that in the late 90s, early 2000s, the ECMWF model, which is you know, a well-respected model, had two different parameterizations for the stable boundary layer, one for the dry convective boundary layer, one for stratocumulus mixing that actually was in the cloud scheme, not in the boundary layer, another one for shallow convection and, you, and for cloud microphysics and macro was a, a big confusion. So this, has, this is what our models are. And in reality, trying to come up with unified parameterizations is not just um, you know, a, a very exciting and interesting thought of theoretical challenge is also a very practical and engineering one. Now, in the wonderful book that Dave Randall edited about 20 years ago on the general circulation, uh, general circulation model development, Arakawa has a couple of very nice articles that, that I'm sure you've read. And he has a quote, he writes something about when he's discussing the history of the UCLA GCM parameterization, he said the possibility of treating cloud-free cloud-free cumulus stop, stratocumulus stop using the unified framework was extremely attractive to me. So I, I would actually argue that as you will um, understand throughout the presentation, I guess, and, and as many of you know, that this sort of quest of finding unified boundary layer and convection parameterizations is actually something that starts on this very campus, right, with people right here and, 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 and Arakawa about 50 years ago. Now, the unified parameterization that Arakawa is referring to is this sort of variable depth, uh, lowest model level uh, boundary layer parameterization, but it could represent cloudy and clear boundary layers. And it was done also in the context of coupling to convection parameterization. And th these are some of the key references about that particular parameterization that ended up being very successful in many respects, not only as a parameterization for a GCM, but a way to actually think about the problem. So the key goal in, in the end for a lot of us has been to come up with sort of unified approaches for representing both the boundary layer and convection. And a key problem or a, a major problem is the fact that 
what do you have here is actually different communities that, that have sort of historically grown somewhat separately, right? You have the boundary layer uh, community, the turbulence community, and the convection, and they not always have used the same, even the same ways of thinking. Now, you start with eddy diffusivity, so at the, you know, at the base of any uh, atmospheric model, ocean model, uh, any fluid model that has turbulence, you have an eddy diffusivity uh, closure, right? And eddy diffusivity is as old as the modern studies of turbulence is almost as old as Navier Stokes itself. It's from the 1850s and 70s. And the idea, as you all know very well, is that if you're trying to represent a term that, in this case, this is just the covariance between the vertical velocity and you know, the perturbation of a particular variable, you represent it as proportional to the gradient. And then the quest is, you know, how do you find what this eddy diffusivity coefficient is? And then, you know, in the, in the early 1900s, Taylor, Prantov, von Karman, in slightly different perspectives, developed the idea of the mixing length. So you actually split this up between a vertical, between a velocity and, and a mixing length. And eddy diffusivity is fairly successful. It, it, it's fairly successful in representing things like moderately stable boundary layers, not that stable boundary layers are not a challenge, they, they still are very much a challenge, uh, and, and the surface layer, for example. So, so in a way, you cannot run a weather or climate prediction model without an eddy diffusivity uh, parameterization, and it's going to be at the sort of the core of everything we're going to talk about a little bit. Now, the other perspective that I'll talk about is the one coming from the convection community, from the, com from the community that started looking at problems related to convection and how to represent these thermals or these plumes by thinking about actual physical models, you know, a little bit like toy models that in a way represent the budgets of the properties that you want in those plumes and the interaction with the environment. And probably started with Stommel probably before that, but it really is and becomes a component of GCMs with Arakawa. So Arakawa is the first one to actually uh, use this sort of concepts, these plume concepts, the mass flux concept, to actually develop a parameterization. This is just the first, this is the report. That I don't think this report is the quote. I think that the 69 is part of the proceedings of one of the WMO meetings in weather prediction, I think in Japan, if I'm not mistaken. This is a little bit later on, but then of course there's Arakawa Schubert that, that we've discussed. Now with mass flux, when you try to represent in a very simplified way, people have discussed this, this um, in great detail today and yesterday, but what you're trying to do is the same covariance term that we've uh, associated with diffusivity, we associate with sort of updraft properties and with the mass flux, which is basically, um, you know, the product of the sort of updraft area, if you're thinking about updrafts and, and, and the vertical velocity. Now, what we will show is basically, you know, a, a simplified version of mass flux, but the basic assumptions of the R you integrate over the plume area, you assume steady state, and if you neglect some sources and sinks, you end up with equations that look very much like this ones, in which you know, a moist conservative property like liquid water potential temperature or total water is just represented by sort of an entraining plume model. And then you have a very similar equation with an addition of a buoyancy production term that uh, sort of regulates the kinetic energy of the plume. Now, the updraft area is, is, is a different question, and, and I, I may touch on that later on, uh, because people may use different approaches. Now, one of the things that some of us have done in, you know, over the last 20 years is try to bring these two concepts together. And so here, what we did was something extremely simple. If you actually do the two different decompositions, so you actually use a Reynolds decomposition at the same time, you also divide a grid box in updrafts and downdrafts, or, or you know, an area that's going up and an area that's going down, you end up with a covariance with a vertical flux that consists of three different terms. Uh, one that is sort of the turbulence inside the plumes, the turbulence in the environment around it, and then sort of the, the you know, how they talk to each other, how do they interact and, and uh, exchange properties. If you, in addition to a simple assumption of a very small fractional area, and this has been discussed as well, the equation simplifies even further. And if you then say, well, you know, why don't we assume eddy diffusivity for the sort of small scale turbulence that exists around the plumes in the environment and use mass flux for the plumes, you can have actually a, a, a parameterization that brings those two concepts together. And, it, and they sort of brought together from the beginning at birth, right? So it's not only from an, the algorithm, but the numerical solver, everything is sort of done in, um, in a consistent way, which is not necessarily, the, it's not the case in, in current models or in, in many models. Now, this is just an example of why it's actually useful, and I'll show another similar diagram um, in five minutes or so, 
This is a cut of an LES, a large eddy simulation model across, uh, this is probably BOMEX, but it's a shallow convection case. You do a cut across maybe a, about 1,000 meters, about 500 meters above cloud base, and then you pick all the values of the points for total water and for vertical velocity. And if you plot them, you'll see that there's sort of two fundamental regions of mixing. One that is much more sort of Gaussian look, you know, Gaussian looking, well distributed, small scale mix mixing that can be represented by eddy diffusivity. But the other one is this sort of highly skewed part of the distribution where the action is actually taking place, which is on this, you know, extreme of the distribution where the plumes are actually bringing properties from the subcloud layer uh, to levels above. Now, let me go back a little bit to the dry convective boundary layer because I wanted to, to, to highlight the fact that the mass flux concept itself came, and, and a lot of what I'll show is actually bringing into the boundary layer community, the turbulence community where I sort of come from, this concept of the mass flux. And how useful it is to actually tackle many of the problems that the turbulence community has not been able to tackle using other tools. So the, the simplest problem you can think in terms of convection in the atmosphere is this dry convective boundary layer problem. What you have is just a, a surface that is heated and basically generates eddies, thermals, plumes that basically bring properties from the surface up to different levels and they entrain and some of them die you know, younger and others live uh, longer and, and go further. But if you neglect horizontal heterogeneities, if you assume that there's almost no water vapor, there's very little radiation, there's no phase transition, then you can have the simplest equation possible, forget the, the specific humidity, you can have the simplest equation possible to actually solve for a convective boundary layer. And even this one, right, in which you only have the Eulerian tendency of the mean and this vertical divergence of the flux is actually extremely difficult to solve. And most models, or many models today, operational models, still have a tough time doing the counter gradient flux, which I'll explain what it is, and, 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 and the PBL top entrainment, which means that the boundary layer doesn't grow well enough. And that has enormous implications for things like air quality, for example, that you know, if you have pollutants, they actually don't mix at the same level, then the concentrations are completely different if the boundary layer underestimates or overestimates the, the top, right? So the counter gradient problem is a simple problem to explain and it's been a bit of a challenge to, to, to solve in a way. So if you have this boundary layer, uh, you basically can look at this. These are LES results, all of the ones, everything I'm gonna show in the next two slides is LES results. This is height for both of them. This is the mean value of potential temperature as it evolves in time after the simulation starts. This is uh, the, the vertical fluxes, essentially look at the full black line, which is sort of the LES result. And what you have is a boundary layer that starts quite stable in the morning and then let's say the sun comes up and you have, you usually don't have uh, a sensible heat flux that is constant, but in this case it is. And what you have is a boundary layer that gets warmer, that grows through entrainment, that is extremely well mixed. So you see a very nice transition of the boundary layer moving through the day. And the fundamental problem with eddy diffusivity is that it's not actually able to represent this sort of well-mixed nature of the boundary layer. Depending on the versions of eddy diffusivity, it may actually get there or not, but in general, it's not. And the fundamental reason is that, as you can see, if you have a diffusivity approximation, so if you neglect this second term here, you just assume this one, you can see that the vertical flux of heat, of energy, will change sign when the mean uh, when the mean temperature, potential temperature changes sign. And that happens at about, in this case, at, at, you know, at the later time, about 500 meters above the ground, where you can clearly see if you look at the total flux that there's still a lot of heat flux. There's still a lot of energy being transported from below to above. And that's done because there are these thermals that are actually going against the gradient. Now, people like Ertl and Deerdorf and others have come up with different ways of actually representing this sort of counter gradient uh, flow by adding a sort of a positive term on the right hand side and what we'll show you is that in practice if you actually bring the idea of mass flux into the sort of the turbulence world uh, you are able to naturally solve this problem in, in, in what is a very physically simple and consistent way of doing so. So if you go back to the LES and select the points that you can measure at different heights that have sort of the 99th percentile value of vertical velocity, and then 97th, and then 95, uh, you can actually calculate their potential temperature, and then if you plot everything, this is again a vertical profile normalized by the height of the boundary layer, this is the average of the domain, and these are the properties, this is how warm um, the different regions of the atmosphere are statistically 
uh, brought together. And you can see that there is still a very strong difference. So these parcels over here that are represented by these lines um, are still positively buoyant and as such still producing a positive buoyancy flux, a positive heat flux. So you can look at this and realize that if you look at the previous one and you see how nice and, and positive and linear this is, this flux is, you can actually immediately look at the, the, the type of formulation you get with mass flux and realize that naturally that this difference is actually going to represent probably, uh, and I'll show you that that's the case, what you actually need to um, represent the counter gradient flux. And this is just the conclusion of this uh, small study in which you actually look at different ways of representing the, the growth of the, the, of the boundary layer. So you have again profiles of the, this is the alias, the full line. The eddy diffusivity alone is the dotted line and you can see the problem, the fundamental problem with eddy diffusivity alone as you would expect is that it creates an unstable layer lower down so as to be able to reproduce a positive uh, buoyancy flux. The eddy diffusivity plus the counter gradient, the sort of the Diodorf solution actually goes almost too much to the extreme of creating a stable layer because there is this positive value and, and it's sort of mixing too much to the top. And then when you actually bring together the diffusivity that is always there in a way and you bring the mass flux to it, you actually are able to represent not only the right growth of the boundary layer but as well the sort of the well mixed nature of the boundary layer. Now, let me show you a couple of results on convective, moist convective boundary layers. So one of the flavors of uh, this approach that we've been uh, pushing forward has been the idea of using multiple plumes. So basically what we have is that we sample the sort of surface layer properties of the moist thermodynamic properties and the vertical velocity. Uh, in that sense, some of these plumes or these thermals will actually be more energetic from birth, right? So, so from the beginning, they are already drawn from a part of the distribution where they're going to be more buoyant, so they, they can go further and, and, and grow taller. But at the same time, we also have a stochastic lateral entrainment formulation that's sort of partly inspired in the Romps and Quang paper in which we can actually, you know, have a stochastic distribution of the probability of having entraining events. And some of these plumes may actually entrain only a few times, and as such, they actually grow much further, much further, while other plumes will entrain a lot, and they will sort of not grow as fast. So there's a couple of important things, but the main one, um, in terms of parameterization in an atmospheric model, is that when you have a grid box and you have this type of multiple plume or multiple thermal approach, that you actually can have plumes that represent different types of convection. So you will have plumes that represent dry convection, others shallow convection, others deep convection, if sort of the environment allows it to, to grow. So you don't have to have transitions from a certain uh, mass flux scheme to another one or, or, or a certain boundary layer scheme to another one. Let me just show you a couple of results. It's a, kind of a busy slide, and I apologize for that, but I wanted to show a couple of things. So the first one, and so this is to study the impact of having this approach using multiple plumes. The first one is the, so these are vertical profiles again. These are updraft properties. So this is the updraft fraction area, the vertical velocity and the liquid water content. The LES range, this is a range between several LES uh, simulations of the BOMEX case is in the light gray. The colors are sort of different realizations of EDMF. And what you realize here, and I'm actually not showing you the mean profiles because they, they virtually, you know, identical. You wouldn't be able to distinguish them. But the reason that is the case is because having these multiple plumes allows you to represent this, um, this updraft properties really well, as you can see. One other thing to highlight is the fact that when you actually look at the fluxes, so the first um, figure over here on the left, these are again vertical profiles. This is the flux of liquid water potential temperature. So this is a moist conserved variable. This is the temperature variable that we use because it's conserved in the phase transitions and the total water flux, uh, liquid water plus uh, water vapor, um, this is how you compare the LES, which is the black line is the mean of several uh, experiments. The interquartile range is in dark gray. Don't worry about the light gray. The single column model here is uh, this eddy diffusivity mass flux, so the multiple plume mass flux. You have the total, so these things are solved together, but in the end, as you do the sort of the diagnostics, you can actually deconvolve them and see what the impact is from the mass flux part or the eddy diffusivity part. And what you can see is that they're actually balancing each other in the way that you would expect them. So uh, if you look, for example, if you focus on the liquid water potential temperature flux, you can see that in the subcloud layer, 
there's a big role still for the diffusivity and the role for the mass flux to do sort of counter gradient flow. But then when you get into the cloud layer, most of 90% of the mixing is really taking place through these plumes. So the plumes are the ones responsible for transporting properties and, and for the flux. And keep in mind that the, 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 the basically the plumes that end up doing this sort of shallow convection transport, this moist transport, are the remnants of a bunch of plumes in the subcloud layer. So there's a connection between what happens in the subcloud layer and what happens in the convective, um, convective layer. So one way to see how and why these plumes are actually doing the right thing and why is it that having these multiple plumes is actually providing this sort of positive outcome is to again doing this sort of um, look at these different variables at, you know, let's say a cut again uh, in an LES model. This is again about a thousand meters. If you sample a bunch of points from the LES, if you look at the total water minus the mean, if you look at the liquid water potential temperature minus the mean, and you can plot two things. You can plot this sort of histogram, this LES joint PDF. So you can see that there's two regimes again. There's this sort of Gaussian regime around sort of the mean as you would expect, but then there's this sort of very positively skewed part of the distribution. And what you can see is that if you also sample a plume, I think this is about half an hour of simulation, um, and if you sample a bunch of plumes that you have triggered during those 30 minutes, you actually look at the plumes at that level and they really occupy this sort of space in this diagram that is actually the space where they need to be to actually be able to produce the sort of the, the, the mixing that they do. So the multiple plumes really do represent this skewed part of the distribution. Now, last couple of slides, I wanted to, to also highlight the fact that this can actually do much more than just shallow convection, and it does, and, 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 and at the end I'll, I'll, I'll show you one, one slide on that for, for GCMs. On this case, and again, it's sort of a busy slide, but, but if you bear with me for a minute. So what we're looking at is a strata cumulus to cumulus transition. So we basically picking up hundreds of, so we're actually not looking at the output of a GCM. We're actually running a single column model forced by reanalysis on a few hundred points and times across the transition from LA to Honolulu. And we compare two things. So in the first set of slides, you have height again, Sorry, you have height again, and then what you have is cloud fraction. So cloud fraction you have from both CloudSat, so these are observations from space, from this uh, combination of eddy diffusivity and multiple plumes, and from the reanalysis itself. We are not looking at latitude, longitude, or SST, which would be sort of probably the basic, the most sort of basic ways of looking at this cross section. We're actually looking at the stability. So this is the low tropospheric stability, and it's the difference between potential temperature at about 700 and the surface skin temperature. But you can think of it as basically going from stratocumulus regions, transition, cumulus regions. And what you can see is that even forced by reanalysis, well, I say the even is not the right word, when forced by reanalysis, the single column model with the multiple plumes can actually achieve a transition that actually looks much closer to reality, not perfect, but actually much better than reanalysis. So one, one of the lessons in here is not so much just the multiple plume result, but the fact that, you know, as you probably all know very well, reanalysis clouds are not something that you should trust very much, right? There are no observations that actually are bringing in there. The, the clouds are just a product of the parameterization and the dynamics. The last part of the slide is, is again, profiles. And, and right now, actually plotting the profiles of the variables, the means themselves. So this is low liquid water potential temperature, total water and liquid water. And there's three cases here along this transition. One is a strata cumulus case in blue. Another one is a transition case. The other one is a cumulus case. The single column model is this multiple plume uh, mass flux with eddy diffusivity. And you can see that the LES and the single column model are very close, even going from a well-mixed boundary layer to a sort of conditionally unstable shallow convection boundary layer. So it actually represents not only the clouds well, but the sort of the vertical uh, properties of the thermodynamic properties really well. The last problem I wanted to tackle and mention is the diurnal cycle of convection over land. And this is sort of to get to the end of the story. Um, this is a well-known fundamental problem in, in atmospheric models, weather models suffer from it, climate models, even today the latest versions of NCAR or GFDL suffer from it very, very seriously. Uh, Francoise Guichard wrote an, a nice paper with a nice diagram about almost 20 years ago in which she sort of highlights the fact that this sort of nice transition that you would expect from observations and, and from LES of going from a stable boundary layer to a dry convective boundary layer, shallow convection, deep convection, 
is something that models really do miss um, almost all the time. So what we did here was to extend this multiple plume approach. We brought in simplified microphysics inside the plumes, uh, simplified downdraft and cold pool effects. In, in, and, and simplified cold pool effects is all we have anyway in the community because we don't really know exactly how to handle that. But if you look at, and you can look at the paper from Kai Sushin, there's plenty of results there. But if you look at the basics, just cloud-based and cloud top evolving over time, or the cumulative surface precipitation evolving over time between LES in black and, and, and the multiple plumes EDMF in red, you can actually see that the model is actually able um, to reproduce this transition from a stable boundary layer to a dry convective boundary layer, shallow convection, deep convection. So you have a single, uh, a single model, a single algorithm, a single parameterization, being able to sort of get out the whatever um, different sort of turbulence and convective regimes that the conditions are bringing it to do so. My last slide is I want to talk about two things. One, I haven't shown any uh, results from how these things behave in global atmospheric models. They do behave well. A lot of the different versions of EDMF have been implemented operationally at ECMWF, I think in 2005, NSEP in 2015, I think, and the US Navy in 2013. The figure here is just one example of um, a very uh, good cloud improvement in the ECMWF model. Um, you can see the, the bottom figure is the new uh, PBL scheme with EDMF. This is the previous one, and you can see an increase of stratocumulus cloud cover that was very much desired. My last point is that over the last 20 years or so, there have been many different groups that have been working and developing unified parameterization, starting from you know, Lappin and Randall, ending with um, Xi Hongtan. Um, going back to this issue of the different communities, you can see it here. You can see that some of these papers are clearly coming from a turbulence closure perspective with no mass flux or convection inside. Some others are the opposite, and, and, and Caroline's paper with Bernando, three papers with Dave, are actually a combination and probably one of the first few combinations of both the mass flux concept, high order closure, and uh, added diffusivity. My last slide is, you can, you can read it, but the main message for me in this context is that you know, a lot of the unified boundary layer convection work that I've been involved and many of us have been involved really started here on, on this very campus about 50 years ago and it, it's a great story. So thank you. <laughs>